right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Inside Writing. This show is presented by Gotham Writers, offering writing classes of all types and sizes. You can visit us at GothamWriters.com. Before we get started, a few announcements. First of all, the Gotham Writers Conference is officially open for registration. Uh, it's going to be taking place October 15th through 17th. If you want to peek behind the publishing curtain, this is the place to be, doubly so. If you have a project you're, you're ready to discuss with agents, uh, again, that's October 15th through 17th, and you can check it out on the Gotham website. Uh, regarding today, a reminder that at any point in the show, you can use the Q&A function to send questions in for the Q&A portion of the show. So a lot of you are familiar with Zoom, but if you're not, if this is your first time, welcome. And on the bottom of your Zoom dashboard there, you'll see two windows, a chat, or you'll see two buttons, a chat and a Q&A. Chat's just there for general discussion for you to talk with all the other participants. The Q&A is where you can ask your questions related to the discussion. The sooner you get those questions in, the sooner I will cut to them. So make sure you get those questions in early. Uh, also, uh, if you want to get caught up on any episodes of Inside Writing, you can find them all on the Gotham Writers YouTube channel or on any major podcasting platform. While you're there, like us, subscribe, leave a review. It helps to spread the word. Now, on to the subject of the day, which is writing groups. We're going to start with a quote from uh, Flannery O'Connell, who said, the isolated imagination is easily corrupted by theory, but the writer inside their community seldom has such a problem. We're going to talk more about that throughout the show, but now let's meet our panelists. So first panelist, writer and founder of Inked Voices, Brooke McIntyre. Hello, Brooke. Hi, everybody. Hey there. Next panelist, uh, author of the memoir, The Man Who Couldn't Eat, as well as pieces appearing in Esquire, The Atlantic, New York Times, and more, John Reiner. Hello, John. Hi, Josh. Hi, and uh, hello, Webanese. <laughs> thank you both for being here today. So first question, we're going to start broad spectrum here. But John, I want to start with you. What is the point of a writing group? OK, good question. Good place to start. And thanks, Josh, first of all, for putting this together, these webinars are terrific. And it's just been phenomenal to see how many people participate in them. I participate in them, I've done others. I, I, I just, I hope this is something which sticks around even after COVID, this has just been great. Absolutely. Uh, purpose of a writing group, I'll, I'll say first and foremost, I think <clears throat> the initial benefit and maybe the greatest benefit is that a writing group confers upon the writer, confers upon the member, a sense that what he or she is doing is important and that it matters. And it makes you feel that what you are thinking about and what you may be afraid to confess is serious enough that you can, um, you can remove those, those inhibitions or that sense of, uh, is it worth your time? And I think for anybody who struggles with all of those things and their lives and trying to figure out, <clears throat> do I have the right to think of myself as a writer? Do I have the right to take time from the rest of my life and do this? Those are things that can really delay you or drive you crazy and become obstacles in your output. And I think a writer's group, belonging to a writer's group, puts all that to rest. I think it solves all that for you and it lets you get to the, the act of writing, which is ultimately the greatest gift. Mm -hmm. So I hope that answers uh, the, the question in a way that gets us off to a good discussion, but that's what I think of first and foremost. Absolutely, yeah. Brooke, what would you say? What, what's the point? Would you have anything to add to that? Or what, what do you see as the point of a writing group? Um, well, I thought that was, uh, those, all of those things that John said are really great. Um, one thing, so I kind of broke it, break it, break it out into three different buckets. One is a process bucket. Um, one is community and one is craft. And I feel like um, what John spoke to is a lot in the process bucket for me. And what I might say is a writing group is a way to bring attention to your writing. And for some people, um, for some people in particular, having external accountability is really important. They need external expectations from other people in order to meet their own internal expectations. If any of you have um, listened to Gretchen Rubin before, I think she puts it really nicely with her four tendencies framework, but especially people who um, 
need other people to rely on them in order to fulfill themselves, I think that they will benefit from a writing group. But also, um, I think the, the point of a writing group is it's fun. Um, you get to meet people like you. Um, you get to cheer people, other people on. You get to grumble with other people. And I think that, um, you know, people probably, you all heard this before that writing is lonely. Um, but I think it's really nice to have a sense of belonging and a writing group gives you, gives you that. Um, and you can remind one another while you're writing. It's nice to both have the give and the get with a writing group. Um, and then from a craft perspective, a great writing group is going to help you get to your voice. So they'll help you figure out where you're strong as a writer. And I think that might be even more important than figuring out what you need to work on um, so that you have the strength to stand on your two feet as a writer. Um, and, and also, you, you know, the story in our heads is great, um, but it is a matter of getting it to the page. And so just like the raw basic fact of having external readers, I think is also, also the point of a writing group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, both great answers. And you, and you both touched on subjects we're going to get to later in the show as well. Um, before we get into how a writing group actually works and, and the different forms of it, I want to first talk about how you even find a writing group in the first place. So Brooke, I want to start with you. you. You've been a part of writing groups before. How did you find your group? Um, well, this is funny. Uh, I actually found my, my group through Gotham, my first group through Gotham. Um, I was, I'd had my second child and I was on my maternity leave. Um, and I was like, you know, first, my first maternity leave, my, my son was really easy. And I was like, I'm going to take a writing class during maternity leave. I'm going to do something that I think is important. Um, so that's actually how I found my first group. And I ended up sticking up. I'm, I'm sorry. I said that this might happen. I ended up sticking, sticking it out with those women for three or four years and working with them is largely why I, um, started inked voices, but so, um, finding people after a class or a conference, um, anything that gathers writers is a great way to find a group. And what I love about like a class in particular is that you've often had a chance to read one another's work um, and give notes on one another's work, which I think is really important to kind of, to test the waters. You just like, um, you know, you don't just walk up to someone on the street and say, you're my friend or you're my spouse. You, you kind of try stuff, you try stuff out and, um, and that's, that's fine and good and normal. And I think situations that foster that are great ways to find a group. Mm -hmm. John, what about you? Where, where did you find your group and where should, where should people look? And, and I really appreciate what Brooke had to say because um, I've been an instructor at Gotham and what's been phenomenal for me to witness actually is the number of writing groups that have emerged from the classes I've taught. Josh is smiling because he's, he's a member of one of them. And, you know, when the classes end, I, I always try to encourage people that this is just the beginning. And if there are things that you like about this group writing experience, you should do everything in your power to continue it once the class has ended. And what has astonished me is that I don't even get to the end of that statement and people in the class are already volunteering that they've done it. So clearly, the, as Brooke has said, you know, the class structure is ideal to be able to build on and form a group. And as I say, I've witnessed a number of groups that have come from my classes, which really I found really impressive. On my own, I've been a member of two longer term writing groups, each lasting several years. And they've both been, um, well, one was from a friendship. One was a writer friend and I, who both knew that we were writers, thought that um, we needed the structure and that we both had things that we wanted to finish. So, my friend was very good in inviting me and then organizing it. That was a group of five writers. And we all had, we were all similarly interested in that, you know, we were writers, we'd been writing for a while, but we were definitely lagging and needed the structure and the momentum. So that was one that was a formed out of a, you know, like-minded friendship. And then another one, I was astonished. I was asked by a group of writers to join a writing group based on the publication of my book. And I never imagined that that would happen. 
And this was sort of interesting to me because actually the other writers in it, there were three other writers in that group and they were all far more accomplished and are far more accomplished than I am. And that was interesting because for me, it elevated what I thought I needed to bring to the table in the writing group, how seriously not only I needed to be about producing my own work, but how serious I needed to be in reading the work of the others, because these were people who were, you know, they found the time in very busy lives to keep writing and they wanted the writing group. It was great socially. We got to be great friends and we, you know, brought food to the meetings and all that, but there was a real structure to them. I mean, it was a real sense that, you know, I'm delivering a chapter of a book or I'm delivering an article that I'm ready to pitch to a magazine and I want real critical readers. And I trust you to understand that um, I want constructive criticism here. So they were both personal. They were both word of mouth, um, but they had different, they, were, they had a lot of different dynamics because of who the people were in the group. Uh, just to add a little bit, I'm part of an accountability group, and that's probably my longest running group. We don't exchange anything. And actually, like we were, um, you know, I'm picture books. They're a couple middle grade, a couple like literary fiction adult. We were like really ranging. Um, but that was something I pulled together. I just kind of noticed a few people like within the Ink Voices community who seem to all be looking for like more of a process group and wanted to just keep keep writing. That was like the, the main goal. And so like, you know, there is more than one kind of structure for a group, like that group, we we check in every Monday and we, re, we reply to each other. We, we solve process problems. We, you know, piss and moan together and we delight in one another when, when we're succeeding. But, um, you know, there, just to say that there are different different ways, you know, to pull together a group and different forms it might have, which I know we are going to get in into uh, later. Yeah, and, and I'll get into the structure here in a bit. Um, I, I want to also ask, uh, just you know, it sounds like you both have had very successful or very good success in fighting a group and finding a, a group that sticks. But John, we'll start with you here. How, how do you know when a group is right for you? Is there ever, have you ever joined a writing group that just didn't work out or you just realized it wasn't for you? I have joined writing groups that petered out. So in that sense, you know, they didn't work out. And I think ultimately they petered out because not, not because there was a personality clash, but we didn't have the thing that Brooke has been referring to. I'm really interested, Brooke, about this accountability group that you're part of, you say that, you know, you just check in. And I, I presume the purpose of that is to, is just to um, enable people to get their work done without, without whatever obligation that comes with reading and commenting on work. Is that, that's the function of it? Yeah. It's like, we're all um, seven of us are people who need to um, shout, shout into the darkness that we're writing and commit to other people that we're writing, but we don't, we can just go do that act and, and report back that, that we did it. Yeah. And sometimes even like, um, we have a couple of really productive members and I, I'm like, after, after a little while, I'm like, I can carve out more time for myself. I'm, I'm seeing this people. I can make this happen too. So we, we kind of, I won't say like, we kind of spur each other on in that way. Um, yeah. you know, these crazy people who are making time, like I can make time too. I, I know I can. Yeah. So. And the group, so starting off with the group of mine that didn't work out, it was for that reason. It was because at the end of the group, uh, at the end of a, a meeting, you know, no one was willing to say, okay, we will next meet, you know, three weeks from tonight. And, you know, Brooke, you will submit work, you know, one week prior to that and we will review it. It was really lack of structure and the lack of structure, I think was a reflection of the lack of will <laughs> to produce the work. The two that have worked and the both that I referred to at the beginning, they both lasted about four years or so, which I think is a pretty good run for, you know, for these kind of groups. Um, they worked because we all shared in the responsibility and there was the 
expectation created that there was a schedule. So at the end of the meeting, you know, who's ever turn it was next to produce work, we would, in the presence of the person, we'd agree and say, I'd say, okay, so one month from today, you know, we're going to meet at Randy's house at such and such a time. And this is what I'm working on. Uh, so this is what I want to finish for the next meeting. And I will send it to you one week prior and you will show up to the meeting having read it and commented and I will sit there and take your comments. So it was really the shared sense of obligation uh, that made the groups work. And I have to say, I don't know if I was lucky, but I didn't run into any personality conflicts in these groups. And I really think it's because the work was prominent. The work was foremost. And it was because we all were willing, you know, as I say, to share the obligation. And I think that really sort of mitigated whatever the, our eccentricities were and whatever personality issues could have cropped up. It's because there was a, fo it was a work focus to it. And that was, I think, you know, what, uh, what made them work. Mm -hmm. I've also had a couple of lovely groups that petered out. Um, and I think the main reason was that as we kept going, we were all discovering. And we discovered that, you know, my first group, that everybody, people did actually want to write different things. And we ended up not being the best readers for each other. Um, so one thing I think is important in your group, like if you write in a category, the other people should be reading in that category. So um, we became misaligned over time. Um, and then one person also just stopped, stopped writing. Um, and then actually that's what's happened in my second group. One person became a literary agent and stopped writing. One person um, moved to middle grade um, and we weren't writing in the same category. And then it kind of just, you know, fell apart, but it's all, it's amiable. Like, and I would read any of their work individually, but we would just not work together as a pod. John, you're on mute. I think it's interesting, Brooke, this sense you're talking about that you're writing for the same genre. So I see there's a chat question from Gabriella. How important is it that members of the group write for the same audience? And I think it's hard to know what audience anybody's writing for, but you can certainly know what genre or what type of story you're writing. So I think that's probably the better concern. I mean, if you know that everybody wants to, every, you know, you want to do travel writing. So you're looking for people in that genre. That makes a lot of sense. The groups that I was in were both focused. Actually, the first group was focused on literary fiction. The second one was focused on memoir, which is why I was asked to join it. And they both had really positive results. There were literary fiction stories that were produced and submitted out of the first group. There were memoirs that were published out of the second group. And I think it's because the focus was so defined. And, uh, you know, that's what you were referring to, Brooke. And I, I would agree. I think um, that's probably something in anybody's best interest, which is to, to find people who are interested in writing the same kind of material that you're interested in writing. And if you know the genre, if you're that far along, you know, I think you really have a good chance of success. And I think it like, as long as your person is reading, like I, I don't write middle grade, but I read a lot of middle grade. So I can be a good middle grade reader for somebody, but if they don't write picture books, it doesn't like, I'm happy to be their reader, but, but they're, you know, it, it doesn't really work out. So I think um, some people read more widely than others. You know, you might have some person who's re who reads like a lot of science fiction and a lot of literary fiction, and they might either be in more than one group or they might be in a group that serves both things. But um, I do think like someone should be familiar um, with the type, they, they should be part of the group that you're trying to reach. Mm -hmm. So yeah. be before we get more into the structure of, of writing groups, Brooke, I did want to ask you, uh, how Inked Voices works and how that facilitates the finding of, of writing groups? Sure. So um, we have a few different ways. So like the most basic thing is like we have a search function. Like when you're logged into the site, you can search for groups. But um, honestly, I think it's a little bit of an overwhelming way <laughs> to find a writing group. Um, and our focus is on small community. So 
Um, whether you're a writer who is looking to host your group using Ink Voices or you're looking to find, um, we're trying to help you build or create small community. And the way we do that is by making introductions. So like if someone joins, we'll, we'll look at their profile, they'll, we'll see what their experience level is with their writing. Um, we like to figure out what their writing goals are. And um, when we're really lucky, we can make some nice introductions. Um, and we might set up like a test exchange with another writer. So we'll be like, okay, you know, I see you, you know, these two guys are both writing um, thrillers. They both have been at this for a while. And I see that they like some similar authors. Let's try a test exchange. And we set that up like, you know, this is, we're not making a guarantee. This is something to try. And we just, we go into it like that. You know, this might work, this might, this might not. And um, we have really nice results with that. And then we also do that on a little bit of a larger scale. We do um, pop-up groups. So a pop-up is a single submission group for up to seven writers. And we'll group them by category or genre. And uh, they, everybody will submit their work at the event start. They'll do one round of exchange. And we conclude with a debrief call to just discuss the work. And after that, it's, um, you know, if you found someone that you want to keep working with, you, you reach to that person. Sometimes we have whole groups that continue and sometimes we make no matches. Um, but it's like, how can we facilitate people meeting in a, um, in a small group setting? That's, that's how we primarily um, help people link up. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you for that. And for people asking about what Ink Voices, I'm going to include links in the email after the show so you can check out Ink Voices there. Um, Brooke, I have to, that is just awesome. <laughs> that is just, thank you. Yeah, that is a brilliant idea. Um, how did it come to you? Because it's just genius. The, the site or the, the idea? idea. Um, well, the site idea came to me from like I was, I had you know, like a three-year-old and an infant. And I'm like, <laughs> I was in North Carolina at the time and I just didn't see how I was going to go anywhere in person for a writing group. Um, I worked full time. I just didn't see how it was going to work. Um, and I think I always wanted to do something entrepreneurial anyway. So just to like, like oh, I think I was kind of looking for something on some level. Yeah. Um, and, but as I as I kept going, I realized that most of the people coming to Ink Voices, I thought it was gonna be primarily a place where people came with a writing group and just hosted it. But then I realized that most people who are coming to Ink Voices were looking. Yeah. Um, and so that's, it kind of quickly evolved to mm -hmm. that. But I, um, I'm a person like, I, I'm more of an introvert. I, I like, I like small, like small, fewer connections. And that's what I, that's how I built the site. It's just the idea of small community partner. You want to partner? That's fine. It's going to be a little bit harder, but let's work with you individually. And, and for me, it's like, just because we're in an online space doesn't mean we have to be, um, you know, big daddy 64 and red table 33. Like let's be Brooke and Josh or, you know, whatever we are and, um, mm -hmm. you know, really help each other just in this format, in this different format, which is probably a lot easier for everybody to wrap their heads around after a whole year of being virtual. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and I'm, I'm sorry, my AirPods keep falling out. They're a little bit not, not shaped properly. So if you see me tapping my face, that's what's happening. <laughs> So I want to get into the structure and we've talked a bit already about the structure of writing groups, but for people that either have a writing group or are, are you know, getting ready to start one, let's talk about how to build out a writing group so that's built for success. So John, I want to start with you. And like I said, you've talked a little bit about this already, but you've mentioned scheduling and having, you know, equal responsibility across, across group members, but what, what, what's like the starter kit for a successful structure for a writing group? Um, this is very basic, but I'll, I'll go back to if you've gotten to the point where you're all meeting and you're together either online or in the same physical space and you want to kick this thing off, then I think, you know, you create a master calendar for the first go round. 
And it's nothing more complicated than saying, okay, there are five of us in the group. What do we all agree on is the right amount of time between sessions where people will have enough time to write and enough time to read. That it is both ambitious, it's going to give us you know, a sense of purpose and momentum, but it's also not unreasonable because I work full time and you know, I have a life. So whatever it is that you agree upon, if it's you know, twice a month or once a month or whatever it is, you come to some consensus and then you get some group buy into that. And then you start doing what I do in Gotham classes when I make the booth schedule. I say, okay, so uh, are there any volunteers for the first week? If there are, that'll kick us off. That'll be fantastic, some brave person. And then, okay, let's see if anybody wants to go first. And these are the rules. And then the rules are, for anybody who's been in a Gotham class, not unlike that, which is the rules are, okay, so you will deliver the work to the group in advance, you know, one week or however many days in advance so we can all read. And there should be a limit to it. So is it going to be either a page limit or a word count limit, whatever it is, but there should be some sense that you know, it can't be unlimited because that won't be fair to the readers and you won't get the kind of in-depth commentary that you want if it's too much. Um, but it should be enough also so that, you know, we get a sense that you're taking this seriously. So, you know, maybe a minimum number of pages or a minimum word count, but certainly a maximum for sure. So set up, you know, whatever the structure is for the work itself, whatever the calendar structure is going to be, pick a, a date, a time, a location, and also, um, I don't think it's a bad thing also to assign a social function to people. You know, I'm going to bring the wine or I'm going to bring the kielbasa or whatever it's going to be, because that gives you a further mechanism to get involved and engaged and committed to your group. So I think, you know, you set up the kind of the craft structures, the work structures, the content structures the calendar structures, and then the social structures, that'll get you moving. Then after that, obviously, it takes on a life of its own, and you begin to get a sense of how far you can go in your critiques, hopefully really far, um, you know, what people are looking for, what kind of work you're getting, what it triggers. But I think you go through that whole cycle one time through, and then when you come to the end of the first cycle, I think you have another powwow, a group meeting, and you say, okay, everybody's had a chance to write, everybody's had a chance to read, everybody's had a chance to think if this is for them, and hopefully you want to stay with it. And if we do, what have we learned that we want to incorporate into how we change things up or what's working really well that we, you know, that we want to pay attention to, et cetera. And everybody's got the chance to say, you know, I, I don't think I can do it for this, that, and the other reason, or it's great. I want to keep doing it and, and let's keep going. That, that was a wonderfully in-depth answer. And I'm going to see if Brooke has anything to add to that. I do, but, um, you know, John's has taken the most important things, which I think are expectations and communication. So, um, kudos to John. I'm sorry for taking all the good stuff. I, oh, a, that's all right. I'll go mine. I'll cherry pick around you. Brooke um, gets to answer the next question first. She gets <laughs> No, 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 no. It's good. Um, so I do have a few things to add. So um, these are like, you know, what are the structural ways you can design your group for success? Um, and one thing to think about. So um, John said your calendar. Another way to think about it, especially for online groups that don't have to necessarily pick up, don't have to have as much of a alignment in physical space. You can think of um, what's your pace. So this is a lot of what he just said. So um, number of pages and frequency. And you might also think about group size. Like if you are a person yeah. who wants to plow through um, your, like your whole novel in three months, you will probably need a different group size than if you're willing to take longer. So you could think about, you know, what, like, like John said, like, you have to have enough time to write, you have to have enough time to contribute to your group. And I think that that's really important. Um, not very often, but sometimes I come across people who forget that a writing group is really a both ways activity. 
And you need to be able to think always of like, what can I give to this group? Um, I like this idea of what are the rules? Something that you might consider discussing with your group is um, the type of critiques you, you give to one another. And you might have found out before you start, um, this is usually one thing that makes people align or not, not align. Um, but you could discuss like, you know, what are the expectations in terms of depth of feedback? Um, is this a group that is going to, um, you know, are we going to avoid um, like grammar and style edits? Are we going yeah. to pull those out? Yeah. And people, you know, I, you know, my own, I have a personal opinion on this, but I do, I recognize that people have different, people have different opinions and some people like to critique the writing more than the story, but you, you should find out whether your group is a group that wants to focus more on developmental edits that are craft focused or if people want to like focus on sharp writing at the line level. Cause sometimes not always they're two different people cr are critiquing in two different ways and they aren't very compatible if um, when you put those people together. Um, what else? So if we're people who are, especially for people who are working online, I actually love meeting like this over Zoom. Um, so even if it's every six months, every three months, every month, whatever it is, like if you are exchanging over like a platform like Invoices or Slack, or if you're going over email, to just punctuate it sometimes with some in-person stuff. It can give you the advantage of having, you know, the, t the processing time to give written feedback, but then also you get to go deeper, you get to be social, you get to form those connections that you, it's harder to form online. Like I'm not going to probably, you know, see somebody's cat, like on, on a call, like sometimes you'll see like someone's cat in their background. You, you just learn different things by virtue of being face-to-face. -face. So I like organizing um, those kinds of opportunities too. Um, what else? I think just one other note, um, a good group can be small, medium, or large. It could be a partner. It could be a group of 10. And I think that that feel depends on you and your pace and what what's exciting to you or overwhelming. So I just want to put out there that it's all okay. You know, you, you don't need as much feedback as possible. You need a, some trusted readers who can support you and help your voice shine. Um, but it's in terms of, um, you know, sometimes I see people who are trying to join as many groups as possible or join really large groups and just get a, a lot of notes back. Just remember that um, just to trust yourself as a writer um, and, and be willing to um, go deep with a, with a, a smaller or medium group can be something to try. You both answered all of my structure questions in one answer, which is excellent. So I want to, before we get into audience questions, I just want to ask one more question. Uh, John, we'll start with you. Do you, do you feel like you're a better writer because of the writing groups that you've been a part of? I'd like to think so. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, the answer is I have found writing groups to be enormously helpful. Um, whether or not I'm a better writer, I don't know, but I do know that the, you know, the work that has come out of my writing group, I feel more confident about. There's no question. There's no question because um, the writing groups that I've been in, for, I've been fortunate enough, they've been very diverse. So I'm getting a different gender perspective. I'm getting a different uh, ethnic point of view. I'm getting a different age reference by virtue of the demographics of the people in the group. It's eye-opening. Um, it there's no substitute for it, you know. As as we all know, and you've and you've said, Josh. I mean, writing is a solitary endeavor. Not only are you in your own space, you're in your own head, and you know it has to be. I mean, ultimately, there's no other way to do it. But uh, there are limits to that process, and what the writing group does, I think, it exposes your limits and gives you the opportunity to address them, it gives you the opportunity to improve on the limits of your imagination and the limits of your experience. So I don't know if it makes me a better writer, although it's funny when you were talking 
Brooke, you were talking about, you know, how do you sort of manage this in terms of expectations? Is it going to be content focused? Is it going to be thematic? Are you going to allow grammar comments? And that's important. But I was going to say, I was once, one of the writing groups I was in, there was uh, one of the members was an English professor who was an intense, intense, eccentric, engaging and demanding personality who I really got to enjoy. But um, one of the critiques in one of my pieces, she must have devoted 15 minutes to grammatical issues, which were in the context of what I was writing, which was literary fiction, you know, mostly were just the, the, the result of stylistic choices that I was making. They weren't necessarily appropriate. And one of the other members tried to put a stop on it, you know, and said, listen, what you're talking about is grammar for a different kind of writing. These are choices that the author's, made, author's making. And I said, you know, I, I appreciate that, but actually I have to say <laughs> there was something brought to my attention through this exercise. It was about faulty parallelism that I wasn't, aware of. And even something as small as that was a lesson that I learned, which I have absorbed in which, you know, I'm, I, I now think I address in my writing. So even the stuff that comes up that you think is far afield ultimately has value. Rick, what about you? Do you feel like you've become a better writer because of your writing groups? Yes. Um, I, Definitely. I'm a very intuitive writer. Um, and I don't, sometimes I don't know what I'm trying to do when I write something. And it's like this analytical process of going through it with a writing group. And I'm like, I'm like, why won't I change that? You know, why is this so important to me? This happened to me recently. I'm like, I tried to rewrite something just as an exercise, just to play. And I was like, wait a second, I won't change my last line. Why is that? And I'm like, no, that's because the whole meaning of the story is this. And it was something that was just subconscious for me, but going through it with the writing group helped me unearth that for myself. So definitely that. And I think also just the points that John made at the beginning about having an identity as a writer, I think that, um, that having a writing group is essential to that for me. Um, I'm not really surrounded by writers in my day-to-day -day life. Um, and it's a fairly abstract thing to be doing anyway. So yes, definitely. So let's get into audience questions now, because we've got quite a few rolling in here. So the, the first question I'm going to ask, I'm going to roll a few questions into one. Uh, John, we'll start with you. This, this, this combination question here, but we're going to talk about difficult personalities in a writing group. So kind of let, let's let's focus on three things here one have you ever had to break up with the writing group and how do you do it without burning bridges and then the other side of that is if there's a problematic person in the group how do you handle that without losing the group it's a good question i can't answer the first part from experience because i it has never gotten to the point with me in my experience where personality has been the reason for breaking up as i say the groups i've been in have lasted for a long time and have just Eventually, inertia, you know, ended them, but it wasn't because of personality differences. Um, although there was one person, actually, now that I think about it, who left the group because it, it clearly, um, it wasn't for her because of this, the type of writing she was interested in. And... Um, at least that's my surmise. This was some, again, this was a really accomplished person who's, you know, I, I, I see her, she does one woman shows and I see her credits and I'm on her mailing list. And this is somebody who's, you know, got a lot going on, but she came to the group, I think, wanting to work out a piece of hers, which was going to be a next solo show. And it was just different from the kind of writing that was going on in the group. It required a different kind of response. So I think the dynamic of the group wasn't for her. She left, and I'll say this, she never let us know that was the reason. So I only surmised that that was the reason, and I could be wrong. It could be that there was a personality issue that I wasn't clued into. But I think if you're going to leave a group, it's nice to let people know that it's just not for you. Um, I think it's, it's, it's polite, but I think it's also helpful for the group 
not to wonder, oh, are you coming back? Oh, do we need to build you into the schedule? You know, all the things that being a member of a group require. So I can't answer the question so well, but I can say if you're in the position where you're going to leave, I think you should do the adult thing and let everybody know that it, you're moving on. Mm-hmm. The second part about personalities I have experienced, um, as I, you know, as I just alluded to with my my English professor friend, um, I find that these things take care of themselves. If I know this is really simplistic, uh, overly simplistic. But I find that these things take care of themselves if you are focused in the session on the work, which is, okay, we have 45 minutes for, you know, we're doing two pieces tonight. We've got 45 minutes for Josh's and 45 minutes for Brooks. And, um, you know, everybody's going to get five minutes to speak to start with, and then we'll, we'll see what emerges from it. So I think one of the ways of managing personalities is, again, being disciplined about the structure of the session itself. Because if you know that you have five minutes, um, you're probably going to edit yourself in a way that's useful for the writer rather than going off on a tangent about the things that bug you or, you know, things like that. So I I think um, it's hard, you know, obviously managing interpersonal dynamics in a group is dicey. So I think your best ally is the structure of the session itself. I definitely want to agree with that, that structure goes like so far into addressing this and also regular communication with the group. Like just as a matter of course, like we're going to be like checking in together to see how our group process is working. Like just to say that up front, then it's like not weird <laughs> to bring up something. Um, I was trying to think of, a couple of situations where this might come up. Um, So some things that came up for me that I've seen not, I've seen like people have come to me with these questions. Um, One is what about, what about people who give overly harsh critiques Mm -hmm. and how to deal with that? Um, So one of my strategies for that is to go back and ask the person, and these are, you know, these are delivered written. So to go back and ask the person what, you know, what did strike, what did stand out to you about the work? You know, what, what should the writer hold on to? What were the strengths? Um, what did you think of the, or I, I might ask like a more um, general, like, what did you think about the character? What did you see about the, what, what did you see as the plot arc? What did you see as the emotional arc? And I've created some templates for that. Like just um, sometimes like there's, the answer to something isn't good or bad. It's just, what do I see? And so if I ask people, what do I see questions? Like, um, you know, how was the pacing in the first half of, of the submission? Or, you know, what did you notice about the character? Like those obser- observational questions can pull somebody out of like the judgmental sort of mode. Um, and that also helps with the second problem that I see, which is um, some people are like, wow, I spent an hour and a half giving this thoughtful feedback and I got back three lines. And the th- the three lines say, I really loved it. I wouldn't change the thing. I hope I see this in a bookstore. And you're like, come on, really? I, I wanna smack you. Um, so then you ask the same thing, you know, what really resonated with you? You know, um, you mentioned you like this character. What about the character? What did you think of, you know, can you give me some examples? So help draw it out of people um, because I think critiquing is also a skill. And then this is, um, you know, the other, the other piece I see sometimes is um, people get frustrated when they give the same feedback again and again and again to a person. Um, and for that situation, if that happens to you in a group, what I would suggest is not point out all the things again, because that like begins to waste your time as a reader. But just to say, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm still noticing X. Um, I'm seeing it, you know, maybe in two or three places. Just mention that out, but don't. You're not marking it every time. You're letting that person. They've made this choice not to revise something. So you, you note it, and then you, you move on. And I, and all that's, I totally agree, Brooke. And and I would say something else the writer can do to help him or herself is when you're submitting your work ahead of time. You can even give some guidance to your readers. 
I'm really struggling with dialogue, you know, or I'm really struggling with plot, or I, you know, invented something at the end of the story, which you'll see, and I'm just on the fence about it. So, you know, if you know that there's specific areas of response that you're looking for, you, you know, absolutely introduce that to your readers. I mean, you also want to say to look, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to prescribe your comments. You should feel free to say whatever you want, but to let you know, you know, these are real questions I have in my mind. It'd be really helpful for me to get them addressed. Mm -hmm. uh, one more thing to add along those lines, whenever um, I always in a group I'm leading will ask people to share the pitch or summary, because I want to know the intention they have with the work oh, um, so that I can think about what are they trying for versus what do I see? and how well are they aligning? And that's something like in a in a face-to-face -face situation, like a debrief call, I always wanna ask like, where did this idea come from? Like, tell me more about your story. Yeah, this is all great stuff. Um, I, I wanna get to another question just came in. It's a great question. Uh, Brooke, we'll start with you. Uh, any tips on overcoming anxiety about sharing your work? Um, gosh practice, I guess. I mean, it is, yeah. I think it is scary sharing your work. It is scary. It's scary the first couple times, just like anytime you try something new is scary. Um, and I think, I think it does help. Like when you're sharing your work for the first time, you can tell that to people, you know, so let people know, like, let them cheer you on because everybody's been in that situation before everybody's had to be brave. And no matter how many times you submit your work, it is always an act of bravery. So it's not something that goes away. I think it's something that evolves. So um, mostly I think it's, you have to muster the courage and, and give it a go, but also know that your feelings really normal and you're feeling like this is this is something it, you might sit with it differently over time but every time I share my work with even with a close friend I feel like a little touch of anxiety because you, you what you want them to say what you know they won't say is that this is amazing and really and truly it is really ready but almost always there's something to be done to make it its best story and um, so I guess hold you know hold those things in your hand together both the um, the knowledge that you have a community around you who's been in this place and he'll be in this place again, and that yeah you probably are going to have to do something for it and you should recognize yourself for taking that big step of sharing. John, what about you? Any tips for overcoming that? You know, I I think um, I think if you have the courage to write what's in your mind and introduce it to paper, then you have the courage to share it. I think if you didn't have the courage to share it, you wouldn't even be able to write it. I think one thing you can do after you've shared it and you're in this session itself and people are critiquing your work, I think you engage yourself then in note-taking rather than you're sitting and listening which is, you know, you're making eye contact and there's, there's, you know, there's no way to remove yourself emotionally from the conversation. If you're sitting there transcribing, you know, taking down everything you're hearing or what is triggering, I think then all your focus is in the act of note-taking and recording what is, you know, what is hopefully going to give you direction. And I, I think at the moment, you know, for the 20 minutes or so that, you know, you're in that state, it removes you from the agony and the anxiety of not hearing that this is fantastic and I'm calling my agent right now and you know letting her know. So in the moment, I think when you're note taking that can reduce your anxiety. But I, I think there's no there's no easy if you are if you're you know if you really suffer from this as an obstacle, um, it's you know there's no easy answer. You just have to do it, and it's you know there's nothing that will enable you to not do it. Um, I, I love the, your idea of if you can put it on the page, mm -hmm. then you're brave enough to share it. That's so cool. Uh, one one thing for our live sessions, like when I'm just whoops, I've really lost the earbud. Um, one thing I always do, like I with each person's turn, we begin with asking the group what was striking or interesting or notable. So we're beginning in a place 
that's acknowledging some of the strength of the manuscript. And I think that that can be helpful, like as a, you know, as a way to get things started. And it's not disingenuous. It's not like, oh, we must do the, sin the sandwich technique. It's no, really, we see strength in your work and we want to honor those strengths first. So like that can also help when sharing. So I want to get out in front of this and tell our listeners, we are not going to get to all the questions in the Q&A because they're coming in faster than I can handle, but I'm going to get to, to as many as we can. Uh, next question, Brooke, I want to start with you. A lot of questions coming in about worrying about having your work stolen by other people in the group and, and having your ideas taken. Is this something you worry about? Has this ever occurred to you? Have you heard about this? Um, I it's something I hear about a lot and I don't worry too much about it. Um, if anyone is in like business, like a business analogy, like you'll hear like a venture capitalist, like they don't, you can submit your idea to them and they're not going to offer you any protection because they've seen it already. It's ideas are a dime a dozen and it's the execution that matters. And I think that the same is true for writing. Um, so many people have the same ideas and especially like I'm in the children's role, like, you know, everybody's writing about the same themes for different, for their audience, because those are the themes that are really important. You know, we've all read fear of the dark stories. We've all, you know, read about needing a sense of home. Like these are things that emerge and they emerge for a reason. And that's because they're, they're really strongly felt. So I think, you know, the thing to remember is what you bring to a group is like only you can write your work and um, like to focus on writing your own story. It would be also, also, be, also be like an awful lot of work. Just, you know, you to spend your time trying to copy other people, like what a, what a waste. Um, but you no, know, I don't spend much time on that at all. And it does happen. Like I'll see in the rights report, I'll see, oh my, mm -hmm you know, dang it, I, someone's writing the story that's way too similar. And of course, I've never met this person. I've never shared work with this person. I have no way of knowing this person, but things happen. And, and you know, you just have to keep writing. John, what about you? Anything to add to it? I'm just, I, I mean, I've seen the questions come up here, Josh, and, and I'm listening to what Brooke has to say. I mean, I'm, I have to say, I don't have, I'm unaware of the, I was unaware that it was, uh, you know, such concern to people. Um, I guess I can understand why it never really occurred to me. I guess it should have. I mean, I suppose in Hollywood, it's an issue <laughs> uh, more than in a writer's group. The thing also, I mean, I completely agree with, with what Brooke was saying was just, I mean, there are really only six stories that ever get told over and over and over and over again. You don't have an original idea. You have an original experience. Uh, if you're writing memoir, yeah, you've got your life experience and it would be outright theft to someone to, to, to take your life experience and to graft it on something of theirs. But other than if you're writing memoir, if you're, you know, if you're writing fiction in any genre, it's again, you know, it's the, it's what your imagination is producing, but it's within the parameters of every story that's ever been written, knowing that there are only <laughs> a few themes that we all keep coming back to. And as Brooke said, ultimately, it comes down to your storytelling ability. So I guess it's a risk, but I don't think it's one that should preclude you from trust, you know, from, from wanting to work up the trust to get something valuable out of the writing group dynamic. I mean, I, it's funny though. I mean, you do think, okay, well, am I, I've, heard, I've become aware of an idea. You know, I have my own sort of thought about what to do with that is, is that off limits now, you know? I, I don't know. I don't think anything should be off limits to any artist. Mm -hmm. But so, maybe that, maybe that's I can I can see where that would be a problem, and 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 maybe that's naive. I mean, I had a <laughs> I had a student in memoir writing class who wrote about a culture that was so far different from my own experience. I was completely captivated and fascinated by it, and she was writing about things that had happened to her family in the 1940s, and. I've never done anything with this, but I was, I was just so um, engrossed in the culture that she was, not about her personal experience, but in the culture that she was writing about, that I thought that would be a magnificent setting for fiction. Now, is that theft? 
I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, ex I'm exposed to a story, to a culture, to a history I didn't know much about that I just think really sets up dynamics for compelling storytelling. And I thought, well, what would I do with it? I haven't, you know, say in this case, but I don't know. I think that's just sort of human nature. If you're listening and it triggers thoughts, I think that's just part of the, the gamble you have to take. So last thing I'll, I'll ask you both is if there's anything I didn't ask that you feel like we should have covered in our discussion of writing groups. Uh, John, we'll start with you on this. Uh, anything you didn't ask? I guess someone had posed this question, what do you do when it's over? Um, because you know they all have life cycles and uh, I think most of them eventually come to an end. I think when a writing group and you're grateful for what it's produced for you. And when you're ready, I think you jump back into another one. I have, you know, I've never said, well, you know, ultimately these things end, so I'm not gonna invest my time in another one. I, I think you recognize that for a period of time, they're really valuable and you can go on to the next one mm -hmm. when it's over. Brooke, what about you? Uh, I was looking at my notes to see, like, I think uh, a couple of different points. Um, first, before joining a writing group, I think it's helpful to just take a moment and think about what it is that you want to create. Like, what, are, what is your actual goal with this group? And that will help you pick a structure and a type of group that works for you. I mentioned that I have an accountability group. That's my, like, my longest group. Um, so maybe you have an accountability group. Maybe you have a critique group. Um, I also meet with some writers every every um, weekday and write with them for 30 minutes. Like that's another kind of group. Um, and we all, we have a different sense of community and we're still cheering each other on. So there's more than one way to, to do this thing. And it just depends on what your goals are. Uh, and then the second thing, and this is really more for people who are looking for critique groups. Sometimes I'll, um, I'll get a, you know, writer who asks for like, they say they want the most experienced group possible and they might be a new writer themselves. So, so one thing for uh, people who are looking to start or join groups is I would recommend looking for people who are at a similar stage to yourself. And that's for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, like those people are going through the same piece of the journey as you. And it's, interesting and fun to be asking the same questions and enjoying the discovery process together, whatever that is, whether it's, you know, the craft base or you're all querying or whatever it is. Um, and then also you, you want to think with a group, like, what am I giving? What am I getting from the group? So just uh, if you're asking for, you know, to be the most experienced group of writers, ideally professional published and you're brand new, you have to think about like, what is it that you're giving, you know, what, what are you able to give to that group? So just to always think about that idea of balance and embrace where you are in the process, because where you are in the process is where you need to be. And it's very exciting and you can boost each other up along the way. So um, I think people who are, you know, it doesn't have to be literally the same, but in the same band of, you know, stage as you are. Mm -hmm. So go ahead, John. No, I, I, I think that's terrific. And, and, and I think generally, I'm sure this is why Brooke is so good at what she does. I mean, she obviously is able to break down all these into their constituent pieces. And, and, I, and I do think that's, you know, overall, as we've been discussing, to the extent that you can be structured and prepared and committed, that's going to solve a multitude of ills. So all this other stuff you're worried about, you know, about personality issues or people stealing your ideas or the competition, you know, the group dynamic and all that. Again, I think if everything can take a back to the extent that you can structure these groups so that the work is primary, everything else takes a back seat. And ultimately then you're getting what you want. I mean, what, you know, what do you want out of this? You want an audience for your work. You want to know that what you're doing um, is generating some response in people. And that response is going to give you direction about how to keep going with it. Mm -hmm. So I think everything that we've said can, you know, fit under the umbrella of the steps that you can take to give some structure to the group will 
solve all the other things that, you know, that can, that can derail the process. Mm -hmm. So then very last thing, I just want to give you both a chance to tell people where to find you online. If you have anything to promote, uh, Brooke, we'll start with you. Where can they find you on? Are you on social? Where, where, the, where can they find Ink Voices? All that good stuff. Oh man. I'm like, what am I? Yes, I am on social. Um, but not, not very actively, but you can find me at Inked Voices on Twitter and, um, you can find Inked Voices at inkedvoices.com. And if you sign up, you're going to, you know, reach Emily, who's our community lead or me. Um, and you can, if you have an individual question, you can send me an email. I'm just Brooke at inkedvoices.com. Awesome. John, how about you? I have nothing to promote. Uh, I'm sorry. You can find me walking in Riverside Park. <laughs> if if you do and you see me, wave hello and introduce yourself. I'll be happy to. And um, if anybody does want to contact me, I have a website with my name spelled out, J-O-N-R-E-I-N-E-R dot -E -E com. And there's a contact drop down there. And I'm happy to, you know, to respond to anything anybody sends me. All right. Thank you both so much for being here. To all of our listeners, we're back next week. Same time, same place. We're talking about inside page to screen. So we're going to get talk about how stories become television and movies. And But until then, again, Brooke, John, thank you both so much for being here today. Thank you, Josh. Uh, and thank, thank you for having me. Thanks to all the webinar people. This was terrific. And we'll see you all next week. Have a good one. Bye-bye.